Good evening, everybody. Hi, thanks for braving the disgusting weather and the disgusting parking. And it's nice to see all of you here. This is uh, part two of Celebrations of Time. And next semester, we will have parts three and four. In part one, some of you were probably here, we were looking at anniversaries and what the passage of time had to do uh, with events from the past. There'll be one present presentation like that today, and the others are more about time itself and what time is like. It's an elusive concept. Fortunately, we have four brilliant people, as always, to clarify things for us and possibly raise more questions for us. So, uh, and some great music as well. So I'm really excited, as I always am, to have the sound waves begin. So let's get started. Okay, awesome. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Elulu. I'm from Department of Physics, and I'm also from uh, WePAC. So I work mostly um, with an experiment called the uh, Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory, and we're going to talk about cosmic calendar with neutrinos. So right now, you can hear me because of sound waves. As we know it, sounds travel in waves. And that is because the molecules in air, they travel, they collide, and then compress the air and they create pressures. And when the pressures travel through the, the air, then that's the waves that you can hear, essentially. And imagine now you're actually on the moon, and there's no atmosphere. So that means there will be no pressure change. And then if we are talking right now on the moon, you won't hear me. And I have a really simple, extraordinary, uh, ordinary tube here that I'm going to show you. When I wave you around, uh, the air travels with a different speed from one side to the other side. And that pressure difference will create um, a, a velocity for air to travel through the tube. And when they hit the, the boundary of the tube, it's going to do this. And I can make a faster tube if I uh, just wave it faster. So this is essentially the elements of music, the idea of resonance and the idea of waves of physics. So of course, there are more different types of waves. So one type is photon, light. So what you see here, these light bulbs, they are visible light. And what we can see with our eyes are from this very narrow spectrum of photons, the so-called visible light, but actually the photons can carry wavelengths uh, with orders of magnitude. You see, this is very vast difference of wavelengths. Um, if you're a bird, you will be very lucky because you can see UV light, so that's higher energy photons. If you're a snake, you can see infrared light, so they have night vision, so they can hunt in the night. So I have, um, for example, this uh, very simple demo here. I have this painting. It looks very boring. It's like a white pale painting. But if I shoot UV light on it, you can see this very beautiful color. Essentially, the UV light makes a fluorescence light and transform this uh, UV light to something we can see by human eyes. So um, yeah, you're welcome to play with that in the end. So imagine if you're a bird, the eggs you see is no longer like what we see with human eyes. You see this very boring color. But for bird, they look like red. You see, that's the most important thing you have to really take care of as birds. And then the black birds we see with your human eyes in bird's eyes, it's this very beautiful, colorful, rainbow, fluorescent color. So yeah, so that's light. Lights are made of waves. So it's not just the light is made of waves, but everything, literally everything we know of, are made of these fundamental particles. So this diagram shows the standard model of particle physics. Everything we know of is made of those elements. So we talked about photons, which is a carrier of light. And there's also charged particles that you're not uh, familiar with, for instance, the electrons. So electrons are charged, and the heavier version is called muons, and the heavier version of muons, the cousin of muons, is called tau. So these particles we don't see by eye, but we know they exist, electromagnetism. And what we talk about today, we want to focus, are these 
the uh, counterparts of these leptons, charged leptons, so these are neutrinos. So neutrinos don't carry any charge, and they were detected, the first, uh, you know, hypothet uh, proposed by Italian physicists, so neutrinos literally mean little neutral one in Italian. So they're very small, they don't intact. In fact, every second, there's about 100 trillion neutrinos passing through your body, they don't intact, right? So that's really, really good, they don't intact, but that also makes it really hard to detect. So I have this very simple demo here to show you the invisible radioactivity. So this is the so-called Geiger counter. So in the air, you occasionally hear these noises of radioactivity, and this is a smoke detector. I probably shouldn't put my hand there. So the smoke detector, you can buy it from Amazon. Uh, if you're a child here, be careful, don't open it by yourself. So you open it, and you see there's a, a, metal, a metal part, and you can open the metal part and see what happens. So this Geiger counter with dust is, is able to detect radioactivity. So this is so far a so-called alpha radiation. So we have many different types of radiation, and those are charged particles that exist everywhere. We don't see them, but they exist. All right. So what can create neutrinos? Why are there so many of them? Uh, the most uh, common uh, you know, resource is actually food. So banana skin has many neutrinos. It's from potassium 14, uh, 40. And also the sun, of course, is a neutrino uh, source, is from nuclear fusion. And supernova, um, which is from the explosion of dying stars, uh, we know uh, from uh, supernova 1987 that th this is definitely a source of neutrinos. And recently, we have evidence to believe supermassive black holes also create very high energy neutrinos. So to, to detect them is really difficult. Very few of them intact. That's also why they're called um, you know, ghost particles. So the story is very brief, but it's ultimately a Wisconsin story. Because the ice cube detector, as proposed in the beginning, was by Professor Francis Hansen, who is a physicist uh, you know, professor here uh, at WIPAC and also at the physics department with his colleague proposed a letter of a huge detector in noise. And then the next 10 years, they went to Greenland and they went to Antarctica to prove the concept, and it was successful. So by the time of 1999, they concluded the detector must go bigger. And that's the outcome of this uh, adventure. So the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory is located down below the South Pole, and the lowest point is about almost three kilometers down below the surface of the ice. So we drilled 86 of holes, put 86 fishing lines, and more than 5,000 5, digital optical modules down in the ice, and just to sit there and watch neutrino fireworks all the time. And you see this is, for instance, one of the neutrino events going through the detector, and you, you can see this very magnificent uh, light, uh, light patterns that we detect in real time. So if for a moment you think about it, what we do is we're not just using Antarctica ice as part of the detector, we're also using the entire Earth as a detector. The neutrinos will come from somewhere, go through the Earth, and make it all the way to Antarctica ice, and then you know, give their signals to medicine, and we distribute it around the world. So this is one of the highest energy neutrinos we've observed. So if we say the energy of the light bulb here is one, one unit, then the energy of this event is a thousand million million times energy of the light here. So the energy is much greater than what we can achieve from human technology, technology right now on, on Earth. So this is a very spectacular event, OLA, with the size, realistic size of, you know, Terrace, the lake we have here. Um, so these events happen all the time. And one of the uh, breakthroughs we had was a neutrino burst from a supermassive black hole at four billion light years away. So imagine what happens. There's a light years of jet from supermassive black hole travel all the way to our galaxy, to our solar system, and to South Pole, and to be detected by us. It's a, it's a really magnificent story. And then we also have this type of uh, supermassive black hole. It looks a bit different. It looks a bit dense. It doesn't have jets. But we also have evidence. We see neutrinos from this supermassive black hole from 46 million light years away. And this event in particular is interesting because the photons will be absorbed by the clouds, but neutrinos can penetrate through 
and we can see objects like this, otherwise wouldn't be possible with traditional astronomy. So Ice Cube has been in operation for over a decade. We've done many breakthrough discoveries that otherwise not possible. So it's, it's really very cool. And you know, this year, earlier this year, for the first time, we saw our own Milky Way galaxy in neutrinos. And it's for the first time we see our galaxy in a messenger that is not photons. So now for a second, if you think about what this light years is about, you can imagine this is the source. This is the, this is the supermassive black hole. You know the universe is expanding. And what happens is then the light will have to come all the way to us. This is where Earth is. So actually the, Earth, the, the light happened, or the neutrino happened, much longer time. It's, it's some archaeology, right? It's not now. But they have to travel all the way to us. So this is why um, we may say we look at the light from the sun, is not right now, but it's the sunlight from 8.3 light minutes ago. And if you look at the, uh, the distance to the uh, solar system, the star, closest star, Alpha Centauri, is about 4.4 light years ago. And if you look at distance to the galaxy center, center of galaxy is 26,000 light years ago. Distance to Andromeda, the closest galaxy to our galaxy and on a colli collision uh, trajectory to us, is about two million light years ago. And the most distant galaxy known to date is about 13.4 times 10 to the eight light years ago. So the universe is big, it's also old. It was born 13.8 billion years ago in an event called the Big Bang. So if now we compress the 13 billion light uh, years of time to a calendar that we, we're familiar with, you know, 12 months, what this means is each month, will be 1.15 billion years. Each day is 38 million years, and each second is 440 years. So how does this cosmic calendar look like? So on January the 1st, you have the Big Bang. In February, you have the Milky Way. And September, you have the forming of Earth. And the early life on Earth happened on September 22nd. Really, everything we're familiar with happened in December. The rise of dinosaur only happened on Boxing Day, so that's one day after Christmas. Um, and then the uh, extinction of dinosaur is September, sorry, is December the 30s. Everything we're more familiar with about human only happened on the last day, in fact. So the early evolution happened at 9 p.m. on the last day, while the modern humans only start to evolve two minutes before the, the midnight. And all the early civilizations, such as pyramids, was built only 11 seconds ago. And Cal uh, you know, Galileo was arguing about Earth ro uh, orbiting around the sun about one second ago. And in fact, we were all born 0.043 seconds ago. So astronomy gives us you know, a unique experience to be humble about what we are and how insignificant our species is and teaches us it's really we should maybe sometimes step out and think about the challenges we have in a different perspective. So since we're talking about time, I have to talk about relativity. So just two slides. So time is relative. So you remember those heavy version of electrons. So those guys are not stable. So their lifetime is about two microseconds. But if you observe this muons on Earth, you will see they can travel about 30 microseconds. So that's 15 times of what it should be. And that is because time is relative. Well, if you're on the rest of frame of the, uh, the mirror, then the time is correct. So this is a simple illustration to show you time is relative. It's not absolute quantity. And if you want to go to further, the general relativity, um, you have to add gravity into the, into the game as well. So it's not just space time, but space time and gravity. So gravity will create a curvature on the space-time. Then if you have a clock that is closer to the massive bodies, then the clock would tick a little bit slower. Uh, slower. Well, if the clock is further away, then it ticks a little bit faster. So I have a son. He's three years old. Recently, he always asked me, like, how old am I? And he's asking, what does actually year mean? So he's three years old. What does a year actually mean? So I would say, um, OK. So <laughs> One year on Earth 
is about 365 Earth days. But actually, if you're living on Mercury, it's 88 Earth days. If you live on Mars, it's 687 Earth days. If you're orbiting around a galaxy, it's about 230 million Earth years. So everything is relative, and Earth is actually 18 galactic years old in the rest of frame of Earth. So I don't know how much it got, but that's basically what I've been telling him every day. So thank you very much. Can you hear me? OK, cool. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Maroon. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences. And I'm a climate scientist. I don't always introduce myself that way, though, because when you say you're a climate scientist, that just sets the whole conversation starting. Because you know, climate science is a bit heavy, right? You know, Things are going to go in the wrong direction. And then you have this conversation. They say, well, what should we do? And I have to tell them, I'm a climate scientist, not a public policy person. So often, usually, I will just not even go there. And I'll, as a climate scientist, you're usually an interdisciplinary person. You work on multiple things. You have multiple trainings. So I'll introduce myself, perhaps, as a physical oceanographer. And then they look at you and say, <laughs> what's a physical oceanographer doing in Wisconsin? Where's the ocean? <laughs> so sometimes, instead, I'll say, well, I have, you know, I've got training in meteorology. I'm a meteorologist. Are you on TV? Or even worse, what I really hate is, how does it feel? to get paid to always be wrong. <laughs> so you know, my hope here tonight is to convince you, why is there a physical oceanographer in Wisconsin? And we're not a weather models aren't always wrong. And they have to do with predictive models and how you use um, computers and numerics and physical principles to figure out what's going to happen in the future. It's the same thing for weather. It's the same thing for climate, same thing for the ocean. And it's how and why I am here today. So I'm going to tell you about how we predict the future, how we move forward in time using predictive models for the weather and ocean. Bear with me. I've got one equation. It's going to be the same equation this entire time, and it's a simple one. F equals ma. Force equals mass times acceleration. So this is Isaac Newton. This is his second law. And when we're trying to think about you know, how anything happens on this planet in, in simple terms, ignoring relativity, we're, we're stepping back a bit here. You know, Newton's second law will get you pretty far. If you push something, it's going to move or change direction in proportion to how heavy it is. What does that have to do with the weather and climate? Well, let's recast acceleration. If we recast acceleration, acceleration is a change in velocity over a change in time. Here's where time comes in. And what do we call velocity if we're thinking about the atmosphere or the ocean? We have special names for that. Velocity means wind. V is just wind. And if you're in the ocean, velocity is currents. So if we have this equation, F equals ma, F equals the change at the mass and the change in winds over the change in time, and we know all the rest of the information, we can use this equation to predict the future. And that is the goal of weather and climate prediction. We want to predict the motion, so the velocity, the wind, the currents, and the state, the temperature, the moisture, the rainfall, the precipitation, the salinity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, of every chunk of the atmosphere and the ocean. So here's how we're going to do that with this simple equation, F equals ma. We're going to use this version, and we're going to apply what we call Euler's method. This is Leonard Euler. He was a Swiss mathematician in the 1700s, and he came up with this simple way to step forward in time and try to um, turn this equation into something you can solve. So we're going to rejigger this equation just a little bit. And we're going to get rid of those deltas and say that you know, a change in velocity is equivalent to the difference between velocity at some time one in the future minus the velocity now divided by their time in the future minus time now. And then you're going to do this for every chunk of the atmosphere. And you're going to say it has some, that chunk of the atmosphere has some m. And we're going to say, oops, went forward my way. We have some f naught which is all of the forces that are pushing on the air and the ocean in that chunk. So now we're going to do a little bit of rearranging. 
put everything we know on the right-hand side, put everything we don't know or want to know on the left-hand side, and we know all these things, so you just plug it in. We know the winds and the ocean currents right now. We can plug them in. We are going to say we know what all the forces are. We know what gravity is. We know what the pressure from the air is. We know all that stuff, and we know time. And we're going to assume that our chunk of air has some mass that's not going to change. So then we plug it in, and suddenly we've predicted the next, we've predicted the future. We've moved forward with winds and oceans. And then once you know this, you can do it again. And you can plug this back in, and you know the forces the next time. And then you can predict again the next velocity, the next wind. And then you can do it again. And you can do it again. And you can do it again. And this is how a weather, and a weather model works. This is how a climate model works. You just step through one step at a time at a time at a time, integrating forward into the future and seeing what happens. Now, you know, one thing I kind of brushed under the surface here is, well, how did we figure out the forces at the next time? That's actually pretty complicated. Weather and climate models are more than just Newton's second law. There's a bunch of other things that go into them. And they all kind of come in in this force part. And there's a bunch of, there's, there's four main categories of forces that we tend to use. So gravity, you know, gravity pulls the air down, pulls ocean down. Um, the pressure on either side of your chunk of air or ocean, that's important. Um, Earth's rotation, that one's really complicated. That messes everything up. Everything starts spinning. And then there's also friction. And each of these different forces has a bunch of different processes that can affect them. And there's a physical principles and equations for all of these. You know, things like clouds, snow and rain, what kind of surface you have. So is it shrub, is it forest, is it desert, is it sea ice? That comes in especially with the friction. Um, and then the ocean has a whole host of different processes. Um, waves, mixing, things get stirred up, things get mixed around. Um, and all of these go into some representative of representation of those forces. So besides this, you have a bunch of other equations that are you be, being stepped forward in time with something like Euler's method, one step at another step at another step. So in reality, you have uh, millions of lines of code in a weather and climate model, all to basically solve this equation. Uh, but you have a bunch of different equations in parallel, and you're stepping forward in time. One last piece of information is, so I've been talking about these chunks of air. The way these models work is you have to solve the winds and the currents for everywhere, so you divide up the Earth into a bunch of different chunks. So you divide it up horizontally and vertically, and at each little chunk on the planet, you solve F equals MA and the laws of thermodynamics, all of it. And then you, know, you need to know the chunk next to your chunk of air to figure out what's going on. And so that's why you have to solve it all at the same time. So not only are we stepping forward in time, we're also solving everywhere. And each, at each little block, we've got all of these different processes, clouds, rain, snow, ice, ocean. We have winds, all of it. So now let's talk about what kind of predictions we can make when we use this stuff. So here's back that equation again, just a you know, simple recast of Newton's second law. Let's talk first about the shortest time scale of that, weather forecasting. Weather forecasting is what we call an initial value problem. And that means that the initial value you plug in, that first wind, that first ocean current, that is super important. And that is what gives you predictability for weather. Um, if, you get, if you have a good estimate of this initial prediction, initial value, you're going to get a good estimate later. This will only last so long, how, you know, because weather forecasts are chaotic. So after a certain amount of time, you lose that predictability. But this is where it comes from. So here is yesterday's forecast from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. This is the US weather model known as the Global Forecasting System. It runs on the principles I told you about, F equals MA, law of thermodynamics. And this is about right now. So this is a forecast from yesterday when I was putting this together. And then here's about an hour from now, and an hour from now, and another hour. And then we can you know, step backwards, go back in time, go forward in time. You can see the green is where we have all of the um, rain and snow. Not a bad forecast. It's kind of rainy, drizzly, snowy. Um, and then you have all of these lows and highs. So yes, I could be on TV, right? Look, you've got lows and highs. They move this way. They move that way. Um, and you can step forward in time. This GFS runs out for about you know, two-ish weeks. Um, but after about seven days, you don't really um, aren't able to predict the atmosphere much more. And that's because the atmosphere is fast. And it loses any information it got from those initial values pretty fast. So here we have a representation of predictability from different parts of the Earth's system. So the atmosphere gives you a lot of predictability in the first seven days, but then you start losing it due to chaos. 
But there's other parts of the Earth's system that give you information that can let you predict something out a little bit further. So there's land, and then in further, longer time scales, the ocean. So land will give you a little bit of information out seven days to 30 days. Ocean will get you out years. Now, when I say you have predictability for the climate, I'm not saying you can predict the weather for a month from now. That's not possible. But I can tell you, is it going to be rainier? Is it going to be drier? Is it going to be warmer than usual? Is it going to be colder than usual? Things like that. And so that's what um, these predictions for climate time scales from the land and the ocean, this is the kind of information they can get you. Ah, so my slide got messed up by the PC. Fun. Well, anyway. This is, a fork, is, this is the current sea surface temperature in the tropical Pacific. So here's Asia, Australia, North America. Tropical Pacific is right here. This is one of the most predictable um, parts of climate system. And right now, we're in what's known as a really strong El Nino event. And El Nino means it's warm along the tropical Pacific. This is a really big one. And because it's really big, it means that um, there's a lot of other things that are connected to the SSTs in the tropical Pacific. So the jets um, will give you, this will affect the jets in the Northern Hemisphere, which will make um, climate over North America a little bit different during the winter than it normally would be. We can predict El Nino events out months to a year, maybe, maybe two years, um, because it's a very predictable part of the system. It's a, a, it's a phenomena where the ocean and the atmosphere are communicating together, and the ocean kind of slows things down because the ocean's slower. So whenever you have a big El Nino event like this, people tend to get really excited because we know how to think about this and what it's going to be doing in a few months to a year from now. Let's go forward a little bit further in our time scales. So if we want to know what the climate's going to be like around you know, two to five to maybe 10 years, we often look to the North Atlantic Ocean. So here's North America, Atlantic Ocean, Europe on the other side. And we look at a current called the Gulf Stream. This is the kind of stuff I study, I study North Atlantic stuff, so this is my favorite part. Um, so Gulf Stream is this current, you know, it comes up Florida, it goes up around northeast um, of the New England, and then it turns into the North Atlantic current, actually it turns about here, this graphic's wrong. It turns about right here, then it goes this way, then it goes up into the Nordic seas. And as it's doing that, it brings along heat with it. And any time you have something in the ocean that's bringing heat with it, the atmosphere is gonna feel that. And if the atmosphere feels that, that means that you're going to have something a little bit different about the, the tangible climate that we all feel. It might be a little warmer, it might be a little rainier, or, or drier and cooler. And because the ocean is slow and the Gulf Stream is slow, this means that we can predict where those heat anomalies are going to be. And the, the Gulf Stream is slow enough that, you know, on order of, you know, five years, you can, there is some skill in our forecast, which is, you know, pretty phenomenal when you think about it. Um, for example, the skill and the Gulf Stream forecasts are connected to the Sahel area in Africa, and that when this is stronger, you tend to have a bit shifted northward of the precipitation. You know, this is one of the big results, I think, of this field, which is known as decade-long um, climate prediction, that, you know, you can tell what it's going to be like in the Sahel region of Africa out about five years pretty skillfully, um, which is pretty amazing. Okay, now the downer part, global warming. I'm a climate scientist, right? Initial values. We've been talking about initial value predictability this entire time. That's not important for global warming because after a certain point, any information that's coming from those initial values is gone. Um, and instead, global warming is what's known as a boundary value problem. So in these um, F0 and M, there's a bunch of other parameters that have to go in there so that you can get the F0 right. And one of those things that you need to get the forces right is the atmosphere composition in particular, carbon dioxide. And so how carbon dioxide is changing is going to dictate how this equation evolves. How is carbon dioxide changing? It's an excellent question. We don't know. Well, we don't know. It's, it's our choice. Carbon dioxide is emitted when you burn fossil fuels, so combustion. And that's what we've been doing. And as a result, carbon dioxide has gone up over the historic era. So we've got years here. And this is carbon dioxide um, concentration in parts per million. It goes up. Here's about where are we are today. To run a climate forecast for the next century to model global warming, we need to know how much carbon dioxide there's going to be because it's a boundary value. But again, we don't know. So what we do, sci other scientists smarter than I am who work on societal problems, that's a lot harder. They come up with different possible scenarios. 
there's you know, one scenario up here, the high emission scenario. This is if we keep doing what we're doing and we keep emitting and people don't work together and don't cooperate. That's you know, maybe the trajectory we're on right now if we don't change our ways. Lots and lots of CO2, you know, more than trip, you know, triples, quadruples, a lot. The other you know, side of it is a sustainable future. These blue lines right here. This is where we start agreeing, we exchange technology, we um, develop together in a green way. So we take all of these different possible futures for CO2, we plug it into our climate model, so F equals MA, and then the model eventually, if you run it out, time step it you know, year after year after decade after decade out 100 years, it'll give you a global warming temperature. So this is, here's 1950, here's 2100, and here's the, the global warming in degrees Celsius. Remember this is degrees Celsius, so this high emission scenario gets up to a global warming mean of about five degrees Celsius. Read that as nine degrees Fahrenheit. And think about, you know, if it were nine degrees Fahrenheit warmer all year round in Madison, what that would mean for the winter. <laughs> Maybe a bit better. And then for the summer, yeesh. Um, but it, you know, it's not, global warming isn't even everywhere. This is like the global mean. So that is how you use F equals MA to go from weather forecasts to climate forecasts to climate projections into the future for global warming. And before I leave, I wanna mention what the frontier for weather modeling and climate modeling right now is. It's artificial intelligence. And there's been a ton of interesting announcements in the last few months about um, how do we use AI to improve our models. And so for example, um, just today, IBM and NASA said that they're gonna build a AI climate model. So what does that mean for you know, our traditional physically based models for F equals MA? You know, are we, because these AI models are super fast and our F equals MA models require you know, millions of core hours on supercomputers that are run every day lots and lots of times. Well, it turns out that these AI models are trained on the same things that use F equals MA. So this is, um, so for example, AI models, they need lots and lots of data. And to get that data to train them, the best way to do it is to create it using models that underlying them have Newton's second law and the law of thermodynamics. So even with AI, these kind of principles, F equals MA, the laws of thermodynamics, and this kind of time-stepping approach are always going to still be relevant. Thank you. That's not my talk. Okay. I think I might need to a little help getting it up. Is John there? Mac users on a PC. Great, thanks a lot. Control L, I think, right? Great, thanks a lot. And thanks to uh, Dan and the organizers for inviting me to uh, share some of our work. I'm here in the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery. My name's John Yin. I'm also a faculty member in uh, chemical and biological engineering here had been on campus for 25 years. Uh, and I study growth and decay of viruses over time at various scales. So we'll share, share a little bit of that with you. This is not the direction I wanted to go. This is the direction I wanted to go. So this puts us a little bit, uh, gives us a little bit of context of um, putting recent events in broader context of history. Uh, so um, this has a mixture of viruses, as smallpox, as well as microbes, so living cells. The size of these objects represent the uh, number of deaths, 200 million for the bubonic plague. And here's the virus uh, smallpox with 56 million. 
There are also dates associated with these, 1520 for the smallpox. Some of you are familiar with the Spanish flu of the uh, last hundred years or so. So we've seen a lot of um, pandemics, and sorry. I've highlighted here in yellow boxes only viruses. Smallpox, again, Spanish flu. Here's HIV, AIDS. This is ongoing since the 1980s. And here's our ongoing since, uh, well, 2019, COVID. So small relative to other pandemics, but it is, again, ongoing. Uh, I'll be focusing most of our discussion on uh, features of AIDS here. Some of you might recognize this fellow. A few years younger than uh, um, this is when he started up at NIH, National Institutes of Health. And on his radar as a starting uh, leader of the Infectious Diseases uh, Institute there was this single virus, HIV. Early 80s causing a mysterious disease, what, what was characterized as newly emerging. Uh, then uh, 30 some years, 33 years later, uh, he revisited this work and found that there were a few more newly emerging, re-emerging or resurging, and even deliberately emerging. What's deliberately emerging? Well, you have things like uh, people letting loose anthrax uh, in, in bioterrorism. I've also highlighted here uh, MERS-CoV. CoV is coronavirus. And SARS, this is the same SARS that we hear for SARS-CoV-2. So we knew already at 2017, in the last 20 years, there were a couple of uh, coronaviruses uh, emerging. And, uh, but most people were th imagining that an influenza would be the big pandemic of 2019 or 2020. Uh, again, I will focus a little bit on HIV because I want to share with you an interesting mystery uh, about a decade after HIV appeared. And that was this observation in HIV patients that if you looked at their virus level, it was quite consistent over time, not varying very much. Uh, and it was also relatively low. And the question is, so uh, why are these patients, uh, w what is the basis for this low level of virus? Uh, is the virus just very stable there? So one hypothesis is the virus is stable. There's no reproduction of the virus. It just happens to not be dying. And that one could call that a static equilibrium. But the other hypothesis was that the virus is reproducing, but it's also dying. It's also decaying, and that would be a dynamic equilibrium. So this was a mystery in the uh, early 90s, about uh, 10 years after the, uh, the HIV, this virus, was discovered. Uh, I like to think about this problem in a more physical uh, manner. So I'll do the bathwater analogy, where you can detect HIV in the blood. You can also stick your finger in the, in the water in your tub and sense how deep it is, or put a ruler in. So one can imagine if you observe a fixed level of water in the bathtub, there might be two cases analogous to our hypotheses here. One is it's stable, no flow in or out. You plug this and you have no flow, static equilibrium. The other one is what we could call this dynamic equilibrium in which the, the depth is uh, constant, but it's constantly, you've got a constant inflow and a constant outflow. And those have to be matched in order for this depth to be constant. Of course, when you're in the, uh, you're in the uh, bathtub, you might hear the water or you might see it coming out. Uh, unfortunately, what, we don't have the eyes and ears to be able to see a virus that's forming or viruses that's decaying. So when we make this measurement, we don't have any way of uh, using other senses to deduce whether or not we might be in a static or dynamic equilibrium. So to solve this mystery, uh, folks in the uh, early 90s then started to think about, are there sorts of models we can build? And this is where I'll build a, a little bit on uh, our previous speaker's um, uh, introduction. Uh, but I'll do it a little bit differently in that we're trying to do accounting here. And accounting is thinking about dynamic or static systems in a quantitative way. And the way I like to do it is, uh, well, we all have, uh, have to deal with money. So uh, you can think about, uh, sources of income. So we, we have a balance of, in our bank account here, and that balance is supplemented by wages and bonuses and maybe even tax refunds. But unfortunately, we also have these 
things called sinks where we've got to page the mortgage or pay taxes or monthly bills. Uh, and we do this in our checkbook. We're maintaining a constant balance uh, uh, or not. And so what I'd like to focus on is just, let's, let's consider just one of these, uh, our wages. If you uh, walk to Target, then I think you get an idea that maybe you can earn about uh, 15 or $20 per hour, maybe working 40 hours per week, and maybe you get a pay, payday every two weeks. So if we imagine uh, next Monday you start working and you work for a couple of weeks, then on the, uh, I think this is the 15th, you get your payday. And then you wait another two weeks and you got your, your payday again. So those are the happy days of the week. Uh, how do we do the accounting here? Well, we can, we can imagine on these paydays, we go to the bank and we deposit. So we got an increase in our balance. I've plotted out here, I'm sorry, this is a little bit small, but what it says here is the balance in dollars. And this is the number of weeks. We're going out uh, four weeks, so about a month. Initially for, for the first one to two weeks, uh, nothing, no payday, and then suddenly you've got your payday, and that's about, uh, what, $1,600. That's pretty good uh, for your uh, first pay payday. And then you're waiting around again. You continue to work, and then you wait in another two weeks, and then you get your next payday. And so if we look at this, uh, this is from the previous talk. We had this uh, little triangle indicating change, or delta, uh, and a change in the balance over a change in how much time? Uh, Elizabeth wrote this as time one minus time zero or time two minus time one. So we look at the change in balance over the change in time. $1,600 is how our balance changes and that happens every two weeks. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, we can think about this, uh, well, what if we tried to um, estimate this on a weekly basis? Another way of thinking about this might be to do a change in balance. Suppose we were able to get paid every week uh, the same pay, then it would be half. We'd get, uh, what, $800 per week. So the balance has changed, the time has changed, but the total amount is uh, coming out after the end of the month at $3,200, okay? And we can even partition that down to days. So you earn about $160 a day, right? $20, $20 an hour, six, uh, uh, sorry, eight hours. And you would notice these steps are getting smaller and smaller. And then what is, uh, what is the, um, the logical next step is to, to let these steps become, uh, we can say, infinitesimally small. Not move to d days, to minutes, or to seconds, but so small that uh, the time is approaching zero. And that was the uh, huge insight by a couple of, of brilliant natural scientists. One of them you've heard about here. Newton, we saw in the previous uh, talk, uh, but Leibniz was also involved. So 350 years ago, these two imagined the next step. And they said, well, it's easy for us to imagine it today because we can lean on their discoveries. But they said, okay, let's let this delta time go to zero. And what happens is this, this, this uh, line becomes a straight line and we can look at the balance changing with time and we've got a slope here. And this is a very smooth, uh, uh, smooth wage rate that's defined continuously over time. So these are what mathematicians love as continuously smooth behaviors. Uh, and um, I think it's, for me, it's, it's amazing to think about this concept of this interval of time being so small and allowing us to write this very simple curve, which really is the basis of uh, underlying calculus that we take these limits as, as very small pieces of time become very small. And then the calculus enables to, us to write equations of change as we saw in the previous talk. We just happen to want to do this initially with our wages. We've got the wages coming in and out. And now we can say change of the balance with respect to time. Now the delta is replaced by a little d uh, to indicate that this is a very smooth uh, behavior and we would have to add up all of these sources on rates of deposit and add up all the sinks, and those get subtracted off. So we're, um, we can track what our balance is by doing this kind of accounting. Now, what happens if we return to our bathtub problem? Same as you recall, we have a level here now. That's where we're doing the balance, and now we have sources and sinks. So we can write the level 
uh, of the water in our tub depends on the rate of flow in. How that level changes over time depends on our rate in and our rate out, uh, those rates being, taking the difference. Of course, if the level is constant, then level doesn't change in time, then this is equal to zero. So we have a fixed water level that does not change in time. This is equal to zero. So now we'd like to move on to the virus, uh, virus situation in which we're not tracking just water levels or not tracking balances in the bank, but we're tracking a few uh, multiple species, which is what we've got to do with the viruses. So we come back to our uh, mystery uh, of the um, constant or very um, uniform, persistent virus low level there. And we think about what's going on when a virus encounters a cell. We know that the virus, you cannot sh feed it sugar water and have it grow the way a bacteria could. A virus has to infect a living cell, which we'll call the susceptible host cell. And they form then, when they, they come together, they form an infected host cell. And then the infected host cell becomes a source for many other this might be several hundred virus particles, progeny from that infected cell. If we want to look at this schematically, we can imagine that the cells, susceptible cells, have sources. They grow and they also die, but they also come together with virus to make the infected cell. And then the infected cell can produce more viruses. The viruses can also die and the infected cells can also die. So this is a little bit of a schematic of what's going on in here. Of course, each one of these species is something that can change. The levels of these uh, in our blood can be changing over time. So we have to be uh, thinking about how do we write the equations to keep track of these. Well, I've essentially written it out here, but you can also write the so-called differential equations for them. So as reproducing this, if we now write three equations, one to track the cells, one to track the virus and the infected, then we can look at something like this. Yes, it's, uh, you're always warned not to show equations, but I hope that you'll realize that these are changes in levels with time, and right-hand side in each of these equations has positive uh, valued uh, sources and negative valued sinks. So we've got sink sources and sinks, sources and sink, source and sink in each of these. And each one of those terms then has some kind of logic. The lambda means the cells grow, and then they die. There's the minus on the delta. And then what's going on here? Here's the virus encountering that, uh, that susceptible cell with some kind of uh, efficiency that uh, depletes the susceptible cells to create something that we call the infected cells. So what depletes the susceptible cells becomes a source term for the infected cells. That's this forming from S gets depleted as we form I. Virus is also going to get depleted, though we don't uh, account for that. That's a minor term on the virus side. Okay, so the viruses interact with susceptible cells to create infected cells. And then infected cells, well, the infected cells can make virus with some efficiency of K. If they make a lot of viruses, K is large. If uh, they make a few viruses in time, K is small. Virus itself can also decay. So this is what one can um, uh, use to think about those levels of virus in the blood. And in the early 90s, what appeared on the scene were drugs that could prevent the uh, virus from infecting cells. So that allowed these uh, terms to be uh, removed. And uh, when treating with these, then you could say, well, if those, if those viruses are actually growing from the encounters and that becomes a source for infected cells and we're now taking away those, uh, um, those infected cells, then maybe the virus would decay. On the other hand, maybe we just treat with the drug and the virus just stays the same. There's no new sources at all. So when this experiment was done, then it was found that, uh, that infected cells lasted about three days. Viruses disappeared very quickly, implying that if you don't keep the, the faucet on for production of the viruses, they'll disappear very quickly. So it's a dynamic, equilibrium in that sense. So I've tried to share with you uh, how we think quantitatively about the various interactions of viruses with cells to make infected cells. This is at the level of cells or within the body, but there are many other levels. We were talking about some things that can take place over three days as virus might disappear or on the time scale of hours, but we know now 
I have some of my students had COVID, couldn't take the exam today, two, year, two years out, three years out. So uh, there are also, also time scales here. When you hear about the projections, predictions on how the, uh, uh, how the uh, virus uh, is spreading, uh, those are similar kinds of models, except instead of, instead of counting cells and virus, we're counting infected individuals. So uh, I hope you've gained a little bit of appreciation for how virus growth and decay can span multiple scales. Thanks a lot. everyone. I'm a law professor here. I teach constitutional law. And I am going to like way move you out of science. This is a whole different world that I live in. So that was that was like high school stress for me to hear all that again, but it was fascinating. Um, <clears throat> so I'm here because it's been 220 years since Marbury versus Madison, a very famous case. How many have heard of Marbury versus Madison? Okay. So how many know why it's a famous case? Just take a guess. I'm not going to call on you. Just sort of kind of know. OK. So it's famous for creating the idea of judicial review, which is a confusing phrase in itself. Judicial re review is a term of art that means that judges, federal judges in particular, can review the constitutionality of somebody else's action. So the executive, the president, or Congress, or even states, the Supreme Court gets to tell us when something's unconstitutional. That sounds familiar, right? That's like, OK, it's going all the way to Supreme Court. They're going to declare, strike it down as constitutional, unconstitutional. That's, you know, we're used to that. In fact, we've been used to that for a very, very long time. What's a little surprising is that idea that Supreme Court, that federal courts can strike down things that are unconstitutional, that is actually not in the Constitution. How many knew that? A few of you. People are really, really surprised. It's so ingrained in ourselves over time that that is the job of the federal courts, especially the Supreme Court. But it actually doesn't start with the Constitution. It starts in 1803 with the case of Marbury versus Madison. So start just with a little bit of story of Marbury versus Madison. It's a very interesting story. I actually have my students act it out in class, because if you just read it, it's a little confusing. But when you actually act it out, it's, you can kind of get it. And um, it starts with the very contested election of 1800. Now, how many have seen or heard of the musical Hamilton? Obviously, you've heard of it. How many know, you know, listen to it, listen to it, seen it, something like that? Okay, so you know, in Hamilton, there's this whole big thing about Jefferson becoming president, and it's very contested. And like Hamilton's asked, who do you, you know, recommend over the, you know, Burr and Adams, and so Adams is leaving, and Jefferson is elected in a very contested election to be the third president. Interestingly, as he, about that time, they were the election is. Um, February, and they don't take office until March. So it's a little different time frame than we're used to. So what happens is there's this time that the Federalist Party, which is Adams' party, was still in power. The Congress happened to be majority, same as the president. We're familiar with this, too. Parties, same as a president versus not the same as a president. Congress can or cannot do things that you want, because remember, you need the president to sign any, any legislation. So here we are with a Congress that's very sympathetic to the party of the outgoing president, and they have a ticking clock, going back to the theme of time, of what can they do with that month that they have. So not surprisingly, they do lots of things to try to cement their influence in society. One of the ways you do that is you nominate a bunch of judges, right? This is also very familiar to us. So if you nominate a bunch of judges, judges, federal judges are generally there for life. And so, you know, that's one way. So they pass the Circuit Court Act. They create 16 new circuit judgeships. They um, change a bunch of details. They um, uh, reduce the size of the Supreme Court from six to five. That's also a surprise for people that the number of people on Supreme Court is not set in the Constitution. That's up to Congress to decide. So um, they create a bunch of new uh, justices of the peace, um, 42 in particular. They create some new review um, abilities of the court, et cetera, et cetera. OK, what is this case about? This guy Marbury is nominated for one of those new justice of the peace positions that's created under this act. 
and they have to then not only nominate, but then they have to approve. So you get, you know, the president nominates, then Congress approves these, these new judges, and then you have to give the commission, so send them their letter that they have the job. So it's, they're having to act really fast, because here's Jefferson, literally, like you can almost hear the clip-clop of his, his horse coming in. They're having to do this really fast, and so not everybody gets their commission, even though most of them had gotten approved by Congress, but physically giving them the commission didn't happen. So this guy Marbury is like, hey, I heard I got nominated and approved, where's my letter? So these letters basically are still sitting in the White House when Jefferson comes in. There's a bunch of undelivered commissions that's still sitting there. And Madison is Jefferson's Secretary of State, the guy at the time, that was the job of the person sort of handling all the things inside the office. And so that's why Marbury sues Madison. Jefferson Secretary says, you should give me this commission. Why is this just sitting here? Okay, what's interesting is Chief Justice John Marshall, who writes the Marbury vs. Madison opinion, had another job. Actually, he'd just become Chief Justice just like two weeks before he was um, an, um, an, uh, appointed Chief Justice uh, at the end of January and the election is in mid-February. But he already had another job at this time. His job was, he was Adam's Secretary of State. And so it was his job actually to be the one that delivers those commissions to all these people. So he literally had two hats, and when the election is over, he still has the one job, which is Chief Justice. So he's no longer Secretary of State for Adams, but he's Chief Justice. And guess who gets to review the litigation of Marbury versus Madison? It goes to him. He's the Supreme Court Justice, Chief Justice. And he's the guy who was supposed to deliver the commissions and doesn't deliver the commissions. So it's a really interesting, politically fascinating sort of scenario here, which is why I have the students act it out. So the question presented to the court is, um, basically, does Marbury get his commission? So everyone thinks that it's going to be this political showdown between basically the Secretary of State of this party who's now no longer in executive power, basically bossing around the new Jefferson executive power, and is Jefferson gonna listen, or is, Ma is Marshall gonna make him give over the commission? What's gonna happen? Is, you know, is he gonna force the new president to do something that he should have done? That, that yeah, anyway. So, <clears throat> I'm not gonna get into all the legal details, but basically, Marshall writes this opinion that basically sidesteps that issue in a really creative way. He creates the questions that he has to answer in such a way that he actually doesn't get to the question of whether Marbury gets his commission until very late in the decision. And on the way there, he claims the power of judicial review for the Supreme Court. And what is that? He says, well, we are the court. We have to, for, and this is a quote from him, it's a very famous quote, it is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. Okay, and they ask us, what is the meaning of this statute? Let's take it to the court, they'll tell us what it is, right? So those who apply the rule, I'm the court, I'm applying the rule to the case in front of me, to particular cases must of necessity expound and interpret that rule, right? I'm reading this rule, I'm applying it, I have to understand what it means. If two laws conflict with each other, then the course must decide on the operation of each. If the Constitution is supreme, which it's supposed to be, then a legislative act contrary to the Constitution is not law. Right? So he's looking at, here's this law, here's the Constitution. If there's a law that's in contradiction to the Constitution, if the Constitution is supreme, then I have to say this law has to fall. The Constitution has declared that unconstitutional. And I, as the court, telling everybody what the law is, has to be me to do that. So by this creative approach, basically he ends up with, sorry, Marbury, you should get that commission, but this, the power that the court has to tell you that was unconstitutionally given to the court, so we can't make Jefferson do that. But, and so it looks like, Jefferson's like in this weird position where, okay, I don't have to do this thing, I'm not being forced to do anything, but Marshall just claimed this authority of the federal courts to declare everything anybody does unconstitutional, including executive action, by the way. So it's this interesting, like, being kind of humble, but at the same time, claiming a lot of power for the court. And that is where the power of judicial review starts and continues to end for the, continues for the whole, the rest of our memory of the country. Is it a good idea? to have the court, federal courts making these decisions? Well, that's an interesting question. So on the one hand, you kind of don't want Congress deciding if Congress's own actions are constitutional. Um, you know, you kind of think that might be a fox guarding the hen house kind of problem, right? You don't really trust that. I've seen a lot of snickers here. I don't trust Congress to tell us they, what they did was constitutional. So that's, so it seems like, okay, somebody outside of the political process should do it. And you know, if judges have lifetime tenure, they don't have to worry about getting elected again. They're gonna make decisions sort of outside of the pressure of like what's gonna be popular, right? So maybe the, the court is a good entity to do that, to decide whether things are unconstitutional. On the other hand, isn't the fox guarding the hen house problem applying here too? Because it's, 
Marbury, uh, it's, it's Marshall talking about the scope of judicial authority, the scope of the authority of the court that he's sitting on top of. So that's a little interesting. So this case is super fascinating for sort of the sleight of hand and almost, you know, kind of wicked genius in some people. If you like his answer, it's wicked genius. If you like his answer, if you don't like him, it's, it's if you don't like it, it's wicked. If you like it, it's brilliant. Um, so anyway, so that's where we get it. It is, you know, you know, touted as this amazing case. I used to work at the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in San Francisco. It's this beautiful building, by the way. Go, go visit the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals building. It's gorgeous. Anyone been, anyone from San Francisco or Bay Area, California? They, I'm just gonna tell the story. They had a lot of money to build this court before the 1906 earthquake. It was gonna be eight floors high, and then after the 1906 earthquake, they decided to make it four stories high, but they didn't give back half the money. So they used the eight stories worth of money on half of the floors. So the building is gorgeous. It's got these mosaic tiles and everything. Anyway, fireplaces and judges' chambers, all that. Anyway, as you come into the front entrance, the marble floor hallway, they've got this big, beautiful glass case, and it's open to the federal court reporter, which is all of our federal court cases. And guess which case it's open to? It's open to Marbury versus Madison. It's a very symbolic case. It symbolizes judicial independence. We you know, declare the law without political pressure. That's the symbol of it. And so you have to think about, OK, that sounds like a good thing. On the, and, and the idea here is that it's the Constitution sort of staying above everything. And the court is just sort of speaking through the Constitution. It's not really them. It's not them claiming power. It's, it's they're declaring what the Constitution means. In fact, in Federalist 78, Hamilton says something like that. He says, this idea, he talk, contemplates the idea of the judges making such a decision, even though it didn't make it into the Constitution. He imagined it. And he said it wouldn't mean the superiority of the judicial to the legislative power, like these two competing parties, but it only supposes that the power of the people is superior to both, and that where the will of the legislature declared in its statutes stands in opposition to that of the people declared in the Constitution, the judges ought to be governed by the latter rather than the former. They ought to regulate their decisions by the fundamental laws, like the Constitution, rather than by those which are not fundamental. So it sounds like, okay, the judges are, are just holding the Constitution above everything else. It's not them claiming power for themselves. On the other hand, when you think about it, especially with our court, it's nine justices, so for majority, it's like five people. So five people can, and sometimes if there's a swing justice, it's really just the one, can decide to strike down a law that has been deliberated, hopefully with lots and lots and lots of congressional testimony and lots of people thinking about it and advising everybody and have hearings and it's gone through two houses of Congress and then the president signs it and it's taken a lot of time to happen and it's a representation of the majority opinion of the country. Five people get to say no to that? That does feel a little what you call, you might say it's undemocratic or was very famous theorist said, and Alexander Bickel said, it's counter-majoritarian. It's a problem. It's a counter-majoritarian force in our system and that seems unfair, especially if you start to think about the justices as not these robots who can read the Constitution without their own personal predilections. If you think of the justices as bringing some kind of their own subjectivity to it, now those five people are reading into the Constitution, not declaring what the Constitution says, but they're reading the Constitution in and then striking down what the rest of us have all collectively decided to do. Now it starts to feel like a really nefarious kind of thing that you're all just fighting over who gets to control that thing, which as some of you may be saying, that's what congressional you know, confirmation hearings are starting to feel like. It's all about the judges and we're just fighting power plays and it's another proxy for our political fights, but it's one that sticks around for a really long time because they're lifetime appointments. So if you feel like the Supreme Court has got it wrong a few times, which I suspect at least one time in your lifetime you think that, um, you might not like this idea of judicial review, of that they get to strike down all this law. So think about any recent case that you think might not have been the right answer, you might be upset. And so the idea of legal subject, of subjectivity of opinion is something that sort of made its way into legal education. There's a whole field of legal realism, critical legal studies, all kinds of like, this is not just an automatic objective process, it's subjective. And so this leads to lots of critique and, and distrust actually of the court and frustration with the court. And over time, if you build that up, the court starts to lose a lot of authority in society. And so the idea that some entity is solving the question for us on the constitutionality of something starts to feel a little thin if people are no longer respecting that declaration. And if you think about it, the court doesn't have much more than its reputation. There's no army. They don't have an army. The president could send out the troops to enforce something the president wants to do. But if we decide not to listen to the court, 
they don't have a way to force us to listen to them. All they have is our respect. And we t even if we disagree with a case, we still sort of bow our heads and say, OK, fine, they got it wrong. But you don't see very often, I mean, it's happened once in a blue moon, but you don't see very often the country just kind of dismissing it and saying, OK, we just are disregarding them. But over time, if you build up more and more and more disrespect for the court, that actually might be a very vulnerable position. And maybe we wouldn't give them the respect anymore. And then you have what people talk, talk about as a constitutional crisis. What then happens? Then who decides? So this might be something you might be thinking of FDR and the New Deal and the court packing plan. He was very frustrated with the court continuously striking down a lot of his New Deal legislation that he was trying. He had a very sympathetic Congress and trying to strike, and he was putting in all these things to get us out of the Depression, and the court often struck it down. He was very upset. So he had a proposal of let's not, not um, end lifetime tenure, because that's in the Constitution, but let's add a bunch of judges to all of the federal courts. For every judge that's over a certain age, I'll get one more appointment. So it would have, would have added, I think, six judges to the court under his calculation at that time. So that often is dismissed as like, OK, that's crazy, because then each president will pack the court back and forth and will end up with a court of you know, 300 people. But I've noticed lately, a lot of my students are going back to that and saying, that's not such a bad idea. And actually, in the public, people were talking about, maybe we should do something. Maybe we should have term limits. Maybe we should get rid of the lifetime appointment thing. So the critique of the court having this kind of power is a live question again in our society. And it really builds up whenever there's a big controversial case that a lot of people just think they just got it wrong. And it's their subjectivity that's, that's impacting it. So 20, 220 years later, you know, they, they still have that authority, but our attitude about that has a lot to do with whether they keep it. I'll give you some reasons why people have said maybe it's still a good idea to have this counter-majoritarian force, and then I'll stop. In the wake of sort of this you know, increased concerns in the early 20th century about maybe they are subjective and maybe there's no there there, as far as the Constitution speaking, what is an additional justification for the court if it's not an objective vessel for the Constitution? Is there some other reason for the federal court to have this power? One of many proposals, but one of the, the, the more stronger ones, is that counter-majoritarianism is good if minorities are getting knocked off, right? So majoritarian lawmaking may not be great for the minorities. And so if the court is there to check that and say, you know what, you group think are like not paying attention to these people who really do not have collective power and you're making these laws that oppress them, then maybe the court should be able to do that. And so counter-majoritarianism inherently isn't such a bad thing. Another justification, uh, it might be that it isn't counter-democratic if what the court is doing is correcting or protecting our democratic institutions. So if there is some kind of lawmaking that looks like it's hindering our ability to really fairly conduct a voting system where people are fairly voting, or uh, restrictions on the press or speech, which are so important for us to be educated in our voting process, if it's helping our democracy work, then the court's role in shutting down activities that are happening that are interfering with our democracy, maybe it's not so counter-democratic. It may be counter-majoritarian, but it might be preserving democracy. So those two arguments throw, get thrown around in my class, and we debate whether it's, a, it's, a good, it's still, still a bad idea um, or not. And um, I'll leave that to you guys to think about that. Um, but what, what I'll leave you with is the idea of time, which is the theme, and that is that the, the idea that this has been with us forever, for almost forever, since 1803, doesn't necessarily mean that it will be with us forever. It is something that was created by a justice on a court with a very interesting story behind it. And like I said, whether or not it stays in this role of respect that we defer to their decisions very much is in our hands because they don't have an army and if they lose credibility, they lose their power. And so the question of them continuing with their power is in our hands, and I'll leave you with that. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Dan Graboy. I teach horn in the School of Music, and I also run this series, uh, which is now in its 13th year. And we've collaborated with almost 50 departments. And as you can see, our faculty is just absolutely brilliant. Um, presentation after presentation through the 12, 12 and a half years. Uh, I know I've learned so much. Thank you guys all for just great, great talks. I want to take you back in time now. We're talking about time. We're going to go backwards in time. You don't have a watch. There's no phone. There's no 
central keeper of time that tells you that it is now 428 and 36 seconds. In order to keep track of time, you have the sun, which we're gonna probably see less and less of as we go through our period right now in the winter. Um, but you have the rhythms of the day. You may have maybe your hunger. These are large scale chunks of time. How are we gonna think about how to look at time in smaller chunks? And in such a context, one way that we're gonna do it is through music because music divides up time. It unspools over time. Unlike, say, looking at a piece of sculpture or a painting, those don't have time in them. You can look at it for two seconds or 20 minutes, but they're there in their entirety, whereas a piece of music is not there in its entirety until the last note is played or sung. And so I think that there's something very primal about the way music divides up time. I want to divide up time a little bit using my modern device here. I want you to listen to this division of time. What do you think? Very even, right? If I kept that going for about a minute, I think your emotional response to that would probably be boredom, frustration. So the even division of time into beats is not itself a source of any kind of emotional nourishment. And yet I think everyone agree, would agree with me that music is, and that the beat in music is in fact a source of nourishment on an emotional level. Let's see. Actually, Dan, can you come up? This is Dan Cavanaugh. He's the new director of the School of Music and a great jazz pianist, and he's going to play uh, for you in just a minute. But I want to have him be my assistant first. So you not yet. I didn't know about this part. <laughs> this is improv. OK. So I'm, I just want you to hold the metronome mm -hmm. and the phone. Mm -hmm. One sec. And let's get it started. So you'll hear this in a second. I'm going to try to make this more interesting. Can you hear that? So you notice that what I did, stop. Okay, this is easy. What I did made the time feel like something. I sometimes worked with the time. I sometimes worked sort of in the spaces between the time. And suddenly, what was dead became, at least to a small degree, alive. And this is the way we want to think about pulse in music. Right? It's not just regularity. It has a feel. And that makes it, now you can turn on that mic, which has a little flip-up switch. So that brings us to uh, what we're going to listen to, which is, um, which is jazz um, on the piano. And we have a sort of a piano here. And jazz has a lot of feels. And I want to talk with Dan just a little bit, because we need to get to the music, about the feel of time. And I want to kind of move towards this idea of swing because jazz is very famous for swing, and it's one of these things that people don't like defining, but, it, but they know when it's there. So uh, let's just start by saying, as a student of jazz, when you were a kid. I'm still a student of jazz. So how did you start grasping with the idea of how to play with time as you were playing the piano? Good question. First of all, I had a teacher, right? And, and um, my teacher, helped me understand how to listen, right? Helped me understand how to connect that rhythm to what's happening in my body. So if we go back to the Middle Ages, right? The, the, the uh, Middle Age singing, the person on the end, oftentimes this was kind of the birth of conducting, but they would really do um, something like this. I am not a medievalist, but, and it really corresponded with a heartbeat, right? Um, but anyway, helped me connect what I was hearing to 
something physical, right? I think that's important. Um, and also listening, right? One of the most important things we can do in music is listen to other people do it well and imitate that. So something that I think has come up here and that is really interesting is when you talk with musicians about time, they're always going to bring it to their body and their sense of feeling, their sense of touch. There's this very intimate relationship between time and what's going on in our body. And that now when you're dealing with your fingers on a keyboard, that must be even more intense. Yeah, I mean, it, I, mean the, the, I, I like to tell my students when I'm teaching them the act of playing piano, in my case. I don't teach horn, but I'm sure it's similar. Uh, it's, really, it's really being a high-level professional athlete kind of, but sitting down. I mean, I, I remember when I was in graduate school, I gave up caffeine because I was having issues controlling my fingers to the extent that I needed to that my teacher was asking me to explore because caffeine has, introduces a margin of error. After I got past that, I drink a crap load of coffee. So, <laughs> But, you know, absolutely. So when you're improvising, you're not necessarily playing with a steady beat all the time, but presumably you're, you have the ability to stretch... We call it rubato, the ability to move the beat to be longer and shorter. And there's some of that, but there's probably a balance of that with something more steady. And I wonder if before you get into improvising, if you could just do a 30-second thing where maybe you do something regular and then do a little sure. stretch. I'll, I'll just play a jazz ballad. How about Body and Soul? Does it bring a Body and Soul famous jazz ballad? So you can hear in listening to that that there, besides that it was great, is that there's this time equals motion going forward and then rest coming backwards. And there's an almost tidal flow, T-I-D-A-L, tidal flow of the time as it transforms itself. Even though it's also, there's a certain regularity, there's a certain sense of expectation that time gives us. Even if we don't have a watch or an iPhone or a clock or a high school bell ringing every 52 minutes. So this is the cool thing about this time, is this combination of its fluidity, its regularity, but also its stretchability, its mutability, but within a kind of a grid-like context. I think maybe that's how we want to start thinking about, uh, about time as we listen to some improvisations. And we have not a ton of time, speaking of time, unfortunately. Well, that's OK. So I, uh, oh, I made it work again. Just a little. Just a little, just a little OK. My pedal stopped working, so par so pardon me. So the sustain part is gone. Um, I, as I was listening to these amazing lectures, and um, so nice to be a part of this, you know, I was thinking uh, about another aspect of time that I think is so is so important, and that's how ephemeral it is. What I'm going to do, because I'm going to improvise, I've never done this before. This is not based on any music I've, you know, thought about. That this is it's like a Buddhist sand painting. It's gone after when when I'm done, it's gone, unless you're recording with your phone, and then good for you. But uh, anyway, so uh, I just you know let's add that layer on here too. I think it's one of the really beautiful things about art that involves a sense of time. So here's an improvisation that maybe captures the, these amazing topics today.
I'm wondering if you can give just a little demonstration of swing, what that feels like. Maybe just give a little, little demo, and then two minutes. Yeah, absolutely. So, so swing comes from early jazz, right? And early jazz came out of a, a number of different musics that that all blended together. And sometimes we talk about that like it was this really happy thing, but it was a really a forced thing, right? Um, from from Western me European musical traditions and African musical traditions and everybody living next to each other in New Orleans, which is really what happened here. And so um, a lot of this comes out of ragtime. There's a lot of syncopation. So in, in, you know, kind of music up till that point, we had pretty even notes, right? Right? And so people like Scott Joplin and others who were writing in ragtime started to do a lot more syncopation. So instead of, if here's the beat and we have two notes per beat, so Scott Joplin would do things, right? And so that turned into where we take the beat and we divide it up certain ways, right? We divide it differently. And so swing, especially as we think about it now, but really swing going back to the, the 30s and 40s up until this day, um, really comes from how we think about... Right? So that's one aspect of swing. Cool thing is people like Miles Davis would take it and really almost play really straight, right? So it's not just about the division and the note, but it's also feeling. And this is what you were alluding to before. It's also, you know, if you really get scientific, it's about how long the notes are, and it's about when you play behind where the beat is. So this idea of stretching, but there's still kind of this constant thing happening that you're referencing sometimes. So Miles Davis, uh, I was just playing kind of a standard thing. Miles Davis would do something that was really more like That was almost even notes on every beat, except I was putting accents in different places, and it made it sound like swing. So, so that that that's like the most simple version I can talk about. So hopefully, one more. Oh, de a piece demonstration. So here here's a piece, and again, my pedal stopped working. I'm sorry about that. This is this is new equipment for me, and and uh, obviously the pedal I brought didn't work. So, but I'm gonna do just a straight jazz swing thing. This is this is my favorite jazz standard. It's called Stella by Starlight.
Thank you. Um, we now have a 9 o'clock finish time, sadly. We could go on all night like this. I would love that. We have to stop. I want to thank the presenters. Uh, feel free to come up and talk to us, ask questions. Thank you so much for coming. We'll have two more of Soundwaves events in the spring semester. Stay tuned. If you're not on the mailing list, I think there's a way to get on it, but I don't know what that way is. Uh, and uh, I hope to see you back. And um, the final event that we're going to do, I know the date of that is April 19th, and that will be over in uh, Collins Hall in the New Hamill Music Center, our gorgeous new performance space. And um, we'll have another one here in this room in February. Uh, stay tuned for the date. And thank you so much. And hello and goodbye. <laughs>